All right. Welcome. Uh, got some more Delete Laws Madness for you. Well, kind of. Uh, no new filings, but I had some pretty good questions in the comments uh, on the video last week where we went over the complaint in the California lawsuit. So, and before I forget, happy Valentine's Day to all of you. Uh, I hope for those of you who are attached that it's a great night and you get lucky. For those of you in my boat, better luck next year. Um, I'm going to spend the evening with three very important people. I'll be babysitting my brother's kids so that he and the missus can go to Taco Tuesday. So, with that, so, the question I got was, hang on, how can you defame a business? How, how, can, how can you defame his trifold? Well, that's a fair question, because, number one, his trifold is so ridiculous that you'd think it would be defamation proof. But, let's look into it. So, a, a quick glance at the uh, complaint. In the header, so complaint for civil defamation, stalking, harassment, tortious interference, and right to publicity. So, the two that we're going to focus on today are defamation and tortious interference. So let's scroll down and find them. So first cause of action for libel, slander, and false light. All three. What the hell? So... Let's see. The the important part Let's see. Hmm. Hey, this part is about the GHB. Still GHB. Still GHB. Um, so it, it's a, as a direct and legal result of Peter's publication of the false al assertions, meaning the GHB, Plaintiff has suffered the following damages in respect to his property, business, trade profession, and occupation. Damages of $50,000. Um, let's see. So that's not exactly what we're looking for. So we've got harassment. Stalking and cyber stalking. Assault, even though Daniel Clement is not her. So here we have economic interference. So you, you'll notice economic interference. We're on page 18. is vague, because here we have tortious interference. So, what is it? And on this, he's complaining that Kate contacted his investor, David Condon, which, you know, reporters tend to do things like that.
and okay, I'm not I'm not seeing it, but at some point he complains that she made fun of his trifold and made fun of his terrible, terrible merchandise t-shirts. Um, I assume it's the overturned Terry t-shirts uh, where she said, it looks like it's a terrible Microsoft Word font and uh, I'm going to do it and sell it at cost just so that you can buy it because otherwise it's a grift. So, I I think Delete Laws is going to get excited by this. At, at least his his sovereign citizen leanings are going to cause him to get excited because we're looking at business torts. And business torts are all common law torts. So looking at once again, sometimes the easiest place to go is just a, a law firm website. It lists things nicely. So the business torts in California are fraud, unfair competition, business disparagement, defamation, libel, or rumor spreading, theft of trade secrets, mi misuse of intellectual property, sharing of confidential information, tortious interference with a contract, tortious interference with prospective business relations, breaches of fiduciary duty, and misrepresentation. So what we're going to look at are business disparagement, defamation, libel, and then tortious interference with a contract and tortious interference with prospective business relations. Because in, in the header, he says tortious interference. We don't know which one he's pleading. So we'll look at both. And like I said, it's common law. So for a list, uh, a law firm website is the, sometimes the easiest place to go. But where I'd normally, like if I'm looking at a crime, I'm going directly to the statute. But this is common law. There is no statute. So instead of digging through court cases, here on justia.com, we have the civil jury instructions for California, which, in order to get a verdict, you've got to have all the elements for the jury to look at on the jury instructions. Imagine that. So, here we have trade libel. It's going to be the same for trade slander, tra trade def defamation, whatever. So. Looking at the elements. Name of plaintiff. So, Jose de Castro claims that Kate Peter harmed him by making a statement that disparaged Jose de Castro's uh, trifold or overturned Terry t-shirts or, or whatever. To establish this claim, Jose de Castro must prove all of the following. That. Kate Peter, this is the first element, that Kate Peter made a statement that would, that would clearly be, would be clearly or necessarily understood to have disparaged the quality of Jose de Castro's trifold or t-shirt. So I think he actually meets that first claim. She did talk trash about it, but there's six more. So that the statement was made to a person other than Jose de Castro. So, yes, because that was made to all of us. Three, that the statement was untrue. Kate's opinion cannot be untrue. It fails on prong three right there. But even if it wasn't her opinion... The trifold is objectively crap. It's terrible. It's going to get you arrested at best, injured or killed at worst. It is terrible. His analysis of the law on the trifold is terrible. His t-shirts 
are ugly and overpriced. I mean, that that's an opinion. So, fourth prong, that Kate Peter knew that the statement was untrue or acted with reckless disregard of the truth or falsity of the statement. Well, number one, it's it's opinion. It's her opinion. That that's allowed. But it's how 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 could she know the statement's untrue or act with reckless disregard of the truth when it's her opinion and the trifold is objectively crap. Five, that Kate Peter knew or should have recognized that someone else might act in reliance on the statement causing Jose de Castro financial loss. So I have a feeling that anyone that was watching her and she could have, she recognized we weren't going to buy the trifold anyway. It's his audience that buys it, not her audience. So it, does she think people are acting in reliance of her to not buy it? That's ridiculous. Six, that Jose de Castro suffered direct financial harm because someone else acted in reliance on the statement. H has he brought one person that can say, I was going to buy the trifold, or I was going to buy a t-shirt, but Kate persuaded me not to. Plus, his, his financial harm is because his website was down for months at a time during the relevant period. Number seven, finally, that Kate, De Kate Peters' conduct was a substantial factor in causing Jose de Castro's harm. I mean, number one, she she's going to plead, well, nothing I said was untrue. It was all opinion anyway. I, I didn't cause him harm. And you can't prove, even if I did cause him harm, you can't prove that I was a substantial factor in causing his harm because his website was down for months at a time. It's ridiculous. So. And then we have directions for use, which actually has good case law. It, it, it actually discusses. Um, so, for example, it says, The tort of trade libel is a form of injurious falsehood similar to slander of title. See Polygram Records versus Superior Court. Th this, this is interesting. The tort has not often reached the attention of California's appellate courts, perhaps because of the difficulty in proving damages. Think about that. Th there's very little case law on this because it's difficult to prove damages anyway. So we, we think that Jose Maria de Castro is the one that's going to prevail. He, he's the one that's going to make the positive case law. It, it's ridiculous. So. Let's see. It says, under the common interest privilege of Civil Code Section 47C, the defendant bears the initial burden of showing facts to bring the communication within the privilege. I don't know that there is a privilege here or not, but, but then it says the plaintiff must then must prove the statement was made with malice. So it my reading says that this is basically the same standard as a public person defamation case. You need actual malice. That's going to be almost impossible for him to prove. So, let's see. So, to, yeah, to constitute trade libel, 
The statement must be made with actual malice, that is, with knowledge it was false, or with reckless disregard for whether it was true or false. That's from JM Manufacturing Co. versus Phillips and Cohen from 2016, the California Fourth Court of Appeals. I, I assume it's Fourth Circuit. It, uh, I don't know how their appeals courts are labeled. Um, yeah. Okay, so I, I think that pretty much covers it. That, that's what trade defamation is. So that, that was trade libel. Trade slander, basically the same thing, tra you know, whatever. So, next, we have inter intentional interference with contractual relations. So, the tortious interference with contracts. So, this one has six elements. And, like I said, he claims in, in the title... It, in, in the caption, he says tortious interference, but in the actual body, he says for economic interference. And I'm not exactly sure if he even knows what he's pleading here, but it looks like he's pleading both because he seems to insinuate that it caused a breach of contract, even though he he doesn't list any contracts that were breached because any previous contracts, he doesn't say David Condon backed out of them. And then for basically prospective contracts, it seems like that's what he's pleading. So that, that's going to be the second one. Well, third. So... For the intentional infliction or er, interference with contractual relations. So, Jose de Castro claims that Tate Peter intentionally interfered with the contract between him and David Condon. To establish this claim, Jose de Castro must prove all of the following one, that there was a contract between Jose de Castro and David Condon. I believe that's the investment in coded friends, or maybe jock sock, or maybe who knows, uh, super necessary human. Uh, he doesn't say. Two, that Catherine Peter knew of the contract. Well, she knew that David Condon had invested in. Coded friends. As far as we know, that's the only contract she knew of. And as far as we know, that contract has not been breached. So, three, that Kate Peters' conduct prevented performance or made performance more expensive or difficult. We've, we've had nothing pled about that. Four, that Kate Peter intended to disrupt the performance of this contract or knew that disruption of performance was certain or substantially certain to occur. Uh, I, I mean, no. J just no. Kate was asking questions. Generally, this tort is brought like if McDonald's has a contract with Hostess Hamburger Buns and I'm Wendy's and I say, you know what? I want to screw McDonald's over. So I go and I sign an even bigger contract with Hostess. But a term of my contract is you've got to you've got to break this contract with McDonald's. You can't do business with them anymore. And so they break that contract. McDonald's is left on their buns or without their buns, I should say. And, and so they sue Wendy's 
for interference with their contract with Hostess. Kate was acting as a reporter. I, I mean, Mr. First Amendment Auditor doesn't like it when reporters ask questions about him, apparently, but whatever. So, number five, that Jose de Castro was harmed. We don't know. We, he's pled nothing that the coded friends or whatever, the actual contract was breached. He, 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 we have nothing of the sort. And then six, that Catherine Peters' conduct was a substantial factor in causing Jose de Castro's harm. We, we, have, we have no information on that. So, then looking directions of, for use, this tort is sometimes called intentional interference with performance of a contract. Um, this talks about interference with at-will contracts. So the elements for the tort are laid out in Pacific Gas and Electric Company versus Bear Stearns from 1990. Uh, it requ the cause of action re requires an underlying enforceable contract where there is no existing enforceable contract, only a claim for interference with prospective advantage may be pleaded. Um, So, plaintiff need not allege an actual or inevitable breach of contract in order to state a claim for disruption of contractual relations. We recognize that interference with the plaintiff's performance may give rise to a claim for interference with contractual relations if plaintiff's performance is made more costly or more burdensome. We, we don't have that pled. A contracting party cannot be held liable in tort for conspiracy to interfere with its own contract. That would just be breach of contract. Um, an actor with a financial interest in the business of another is privileged purposely... Uh, purposely to cause him not to enter into a, or continue a relation with a third person in that business if the actor a does not employ improper means and b acts to protect his interests from being prejudiced by the relation that doesn't matter here so third and final tort we're going to look at today because we don't know what tortious interference he's pleading this is the one that it sounds the most like and I like it better up here. Intentional interference with prospective economic relations. And here, economic relations does not mean prostitution. It may sound like it, but it's not. So, for the claim, Jose de Castro claims that Kate Peter intentionally interfered with an economic relationship between him and David Condon that probably would have resulted in an economic benefit to Jose de Castro. To establish this claim, Jose de Castro must prove all seven of the following. One, that Jose de Castro and David Condon were in an economic relationship that probably would have resulted in an economic benefit to Jose de Castro. Well, he claims that uh, he was counting on David Condon to invest in future endeavors. Um, he doesn't specify what they were or what the time frame was, but 
he at least claims that there were future endeavors. So he he may meet prong one. Um, number two, that Kate Peter knew of the relationship. Well, she knew of prior relationships. She knew of the coded friends contract. How how would she have known? At, at least prior to her phone call, how would she have known that David Condon was going to invest in him in the future? How? Three, that Kate Peter engaged in the specified conduct that was determined by the court to be wrongful. Well, we're, we're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, because this actually is a matter of law, not a matter of fact. Um, four, that by engaging in this conduct, Kate Peter intended to disrupt the relationship or knew that disruption of the relationship was certain or substantially certain to occur. Once again, if she didn't know that there were future contracts on the line, how how could she know that she'd disrupt them? But also, like I said, if if a reporter asking questions is enough to qualify for this tort, the Wall Street Journal would be out of business because they ask questions about businesses and contracts all the time. It's asinine. Five, that the relationship was disrupted. We don't we don't know that. He's he's claiming it, but we don't know that. Six, that Jose de Castro was harmed, and seven, that Kate Peters' conduct was a substantial factor in causing Jose de Castro's harm. So regarding directions for use, regarding element three, that the con uh, that uh Kate Peter engaged in specific conduct determined by the court to be wrongful. So regarding that element, the interfering conduct must be wrongful by some legal measure other than the fact of the interference itself. So that's 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 important. And that's from Della Pena versus Toyota Motor Sales USA. Um so her contacting David Condon if it resulted in interference, that's not enough. It has to be wrongful by some other legal measure. So it has to fall outside the privilege of fair competition. Well, this isn't about competition. Um, the Burger King McDonald's hostess buns would be. Um, so whether the conduct alleged qualifies as wrongful, if proven or falls within the privilege of fair competition is resolved by the court as a matter of law. If the court lets the case go to trial, the jury's role is not to determine wrongfulness, but simply to find whether or not the defendant engaged in the conduct. If the conduct is tortious, the judge should instruct on the elements of the tort. So basically, the judge decides as a matter of law whether what delete laws is alleging would be a tort. And then the jury decides whether or not Kate did that. So it's a two step process. So. And I think we don't need to get any further into the sources and authority. So basically, those are the economic torts, the business torts that it looks like delete laws is alleging against Kate. They're not going to go anywhere. That they're absolutely ridiculous. 
this is still a lawsuit. It, he, it, it's just, it, it's asinine. So, with that, short and sweet, just, just over 30 minutes. Um, once again, happy Valentine's Day. Enjoy your night. Uh, stay safe. Don't drive drunk. Um, if you do in Utah, give me a call. Uh, like, share, subscribe, do do all the fun YouTube things, and I will see you all soon. Thanks for joining me. Bye bye.